Prime. I'm your host, Tom Shalera. We got a great topic during this hour. We're going to be talking about something that uh, I'm, I'm going to say seemed to have disappeared from the mainstream media. I know I was very interested uh, a while back there. I guess it was in May when uh, we read about a uh, some sort of a uh, uh, dispute, conflict between individuals on motorcycles. And of course, the mainstream media said it was gangs and these gangs got together and nine people were shot and killed. I think there were more actually injured, but there were nine people killed. And and this to me was horrifying because it was almost like a mini battle. If you're talking about Afghanistan or Iraq uh, and you read about people dying in battle, I mean, nine people died in a uh, city in the United States of America, Waco, Texas, uh, at a a restaurant parking lot uh, between gangs members. And that's what we heard. And we were horrified. Those of us in law enforcement were horrified to think, wow, this stuff is going on in the United States and they're shooting uh, right out there openly and so on. And um, these were motorcycle gangs. I mean, the so-called biker. And, uh, you know, there's that image that seems to be being brought back that the biker is bad. And we're going to talk about that. In fact, I've got some very, very knowledgeable individuals with me about that incident. And they're going to give it from the perspective of, and I'm going to say, the the motorcycle community. I have Jim Baugh, who's returning to the show. He's president of Long Island Abate, a very, very strong motorcycle advocacy group, particularly for safety. And I have somebody calling. Actually, he's from the state of Washington. He'll correct me. But uh, I think he's in Arkansas right now. His name is Double D. He's the spokesperson for the Washington State Confederation of Clubs, but more importantly, he's the national spokesperson for the Confederation of Clubs. And I think I'll uh, I'll start with our, our guest from afar, uh, Double D. Uh, let's start with that. I mean, what is what does the what is the Confederation of Clubs? What what are they? Well, the Confederation of Clubs is a political and legislative organization similar to the organization that uh, uh, your other guest Jim Barr belongs to, but it's intended for motorcycle clubs. So we gather with legal counsel, and we discuss political and legislative issues that affect our community. One of the primary focuses and goals of the Washington State Confederation of Clubs, for example, is to fight the trend of law enforcement profiling of motorcyclists, treating every motorcyclist in a motorcycle club as if they're a member of the gang, and harassment on the side of the road. We were able to pass legislation in 2011, the first law of its kind in America, actually, that addresses the issue of law enforcement profiling of motorcyclists. And so the Confederation of Clubs is a political and uh, a social organization for motorcycle clubs to gather to uh, talk about their common ground issues in politics and the legislature. Okay, and that that answers the question. uh, Just a follow-up to that. There are some people saying, well, you don't need that. I mean, it's not necessary. Am I right to call it a lobbying group on behalf of the the, the clubs? Well, yeah, there's definitely some lobbying that goes on. It's more of a grassroots social movement than a mainstream lobbying movement. For example, when we approach the Capitol, uh, we don't approach it from the perspective of a traditional lobbyist. We approach it from the perspective of a grassroots uh, social movement. So there are people in our movement who are connected and direct constituents of every legislature in our state house, for example. And so we don't have to hire a lobbyist in order to gain access to the legislature we use our grassroots connections. Okay, and, and so, always, yeah. it, it always has an impact upon any politician that might be looking at a particular bill. Um, you know, J- Jim Barr, obviously you've been a, a big spokesman. Now, you're part of that Coalition of Independent Writers. Is that a new organization? Well, it's new in New York. We just started in September of 2014. But it's a national organization that there's about three dozen states in the country that participate in it. But um, like I said, September of 14, we just opened one up in New York State, working very closely with Double D. He was very instrumental in getting that going here also. You know, Double D mentioned profiling, and uh, we all we know what profiling is. But uh, are motorcyclists being profiled? Are there, is there evidence to that? I'll, I'll ask you that. Well, I'll give you an example. Double D shared a, a document that he um, produced in Washington State when he got the bill passed to uh, anti-profile of motorcycles in Washington State. He shared that information with us. So we have pending legislation in Albany that we're trying to get through, but it's stuck in committee. But one of the things he shared with us was a document indicating um, for people to sign that whether or not they have been profiled by law enforcement within the last five years because they ride a motorcycle. And I went around to our membership and to different organizations and clubs, and I brought these letters with me, and I says, you know, if anybody has experienced any kind of profiling, please fill one of these out and give it back to me. I have over 400 signed 
um, complaint forms from motorcyclists that they were individually profiled by law enforcement so at some it, point or another. Where, where does it go from there? And once you have these signed statements and so on, I mean, how, how, how do we get the attention of who's ever involved in, in the profiling, whether it's a direct order from higher levels of, of command or so on? Well, there's a couple of different steps to take. One is a local step. I went to Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone when the Suffolk County Police Department did motorcycle-only checkpoints on the Long Island Expressway on September 28th. Sat with him, the police chief, and explained to them how, how unfair this is. How can you just single out one so, one portion of a community and uh, um and then um i'm sorry single out one portion of the community and subject them to inspections um prove that you're innocent prove that you have all your paperwork well all the cars were going by but only motorcyclists were detained and the county executive and the police chief understood the point that long island debate was making and they've given a commitment that there will not be any motorcycle only checkpoints within suffolk county from their department yeah double but D, what, is, what is the, um, what is the situation in the state of washington as far as profile well uh, previous to 2011 um, profiling was a pervasive problem in the state of Washington, meaning that we were keeping a database of profiling uh, occurrences. And basically, profiling occurs when law enforcement targets an individual displaying characteristics of a class, in this case, motorcycling, that they believe indicates that they are more likely than others to commit a crime because of the class they belong to. So it's basically law enforcement that's based on appearance, not behavior. So in Washington, we were dealing with 100 uh, up to 100 profiling stops statewide a month, and we kept these all in a database and kept track of them. And as soon as the law passed in 2011, those numbers of incidents reduced by over 95%. And the ones that still occurred, if you requested dismissal, are being dismissed outright. So the profiling law here has been an extremely solvent solution to a previously pervasive problem, one that was undeniable. One of the stories I like to tell <clears throat> that demonstrates the level of profiling that was occurring in Washington that I think is replicated across the country. In 2009, two years before we passed the bill, we were at our day at the Capitol. Most, most motorcycle, most states have a day at the Capitol for motorcyclists, and we do as well. We were there attempting, <clears throat> attempting to get sponsorship for a bill to address profiling. Why I was in a senator's office, another individual who came to the Capitol with us, another motorcycle club member, captured on video a state patrol officer crawling through the bushes on the campus Capitol, writing down the identifying information of every single motorcycle in the parking lot. Every single motorcycle in the parking lot. We followed that up, wrote a letter to Chief Batiste, is his name, of the state patrol and also the governor. And we got the response back from the chief of the state patrol that the reason they took that information down was precautionary because their belief is when motorcycle clubs gather, there's a high propensity for violence. And because of that, they justified taking all of this information down. Obviously, that's baseline profiling. That is judging someone for a classification of people that they belong to independent of any individualized suspicion or action. You know, so that, that's, that's, basically yeah, that's uh, very drastic. I mean, to have somebody doing that and, and writing it down. That, but that's profiling. I, I have to agree yeah. with you on that. Jim, is it, is it, I, I cut you off, and I'm sorry I did that. I, you know what it is? I'm so excited about this topic here. I mean, look, go ahead, Jim. No, that's fine. Um, but I, I was saying that there's two different approaches. One was the local, which we accomplished through Long Island debate. But the other approach we have to take on is on a state level, because the New York State troopers are the ones that implemented this motorcycle-only checkpoint procedure on a statewide level. So they're we have to fight that through the legislature, the state legislature. And we do have pending um, legislation, but it's stuck in committee because we can't find enough politicians to understand that there's a problem here about motorcycles being profiled. So the, um, with those letters that we're collecting, it will say we have over 400 right now, we want to take those that evidence and bring it to our elected officials and show them that there's a true need for them to implement um, implement procedures for the uh, police departments so that they don't profile motorcyclists. And Double D, has those procedures been implemented uh, in your area, your political area in the state of Washington? In, in terms of, we mean the profiling procedures? Yeah, in other words, now to finally uh, stop this. Yeah. Yeah, our law requires every law enforcement agency in the state of Washington to do two things. The first thing that requires every agency to do is, a, is to adopt a written policy statement that condemns and prevents motorcycle profiling. And the second thing that our law requires is that every agency in the state thoroughly train their officers and integrate current training on profiling. For example, we have a racial profiling bill with training on motorcycle profiling. So every officer and every agency in the state of Washington 
embraces a written policy explicitly condemning profiling, in addition to participates in mandatory training. Had that, would that policy have existed if it wasn't for the Confederation of Clubs? This policy would absolutely not exist if it were, for, were not for the Confederation of Clubs. It was our grassroots mobilization that led to uh, the amount of attention and pressure that, like Jim said, the biggest challenge is to get legislators to understand that profiling is occurring. And through mobilizing the Confederation of Clubs, we were able to bring literally hundreds of individuals to the Capitol that, you know, not only demonstrated to the legislators that this was a huge constituency that was politically active, but that it was a pervasive problem. Now, these forms that Jim, I call them victim statements that, that Jim was discussing, we did that as well in Washington. We had numerous excellent examples and developed examples of, of profiling that occurred. And then we were able to magnify that by saying, you know, these are not just uh, anomalous anecdotal stories. These are common and mainstay. And we used those general profiling statements to magnify the examples that we'd established in front of the legislature. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a pervasive problem before, but through adopting a written policy statement and basic training, basically explaining to a law enforcement officer that you can't base law enforcement actions based on appearance, it must be based on behavior. I mean, it's a fairly simple concept, but one that I think a lot of people don't understand. I think that a lot of law enforcement officers think they're doing their job when they use appearance or someone's membership in an organization that they define as criminal as probable cause. That's not reasonable suspicion or probable cause. There has to be specific, articulable actions taken by the individual in order to establish probable cause. It can't be based on association or membership in an organization. It has to be based on your actions. Well, you've done, you, you've, the, you've done your homework because you're exactly right, and that's what they teach in the police academy. And again, I know I was a police officer for over 20 years, and I currently mm-hmm. teach in the criminal justice department. And it, again, reasonable suspicious, probable cause, certainly mm-hmm. not based on appearance. Okay, not based on appearance at all. You know, um, this whole thing, and and we're going to get to the nitty-gritty of the show. I want to talk about that incident in Waco. And uh, let me tell you, from my perspective, I I remember waking up the next morning and going, oh, my God, some big gang fight out there in in, in Texas. So it turned on all the media, CNN, and all the Fox News and all that. And they kept talking about the two gangs. Apparently it was about two gangs that um, were divvying up uh, their, um, their turf. And uh, one person ran over another, and that's what sparked a random foot over on a motorcycle or whatever. And that's what sparked the tension between the two rival gangs that were uh, talking about turf. Now, when we talk about turf war and so on, we're talking about, you know, street gangs or, you know, the gang mentality. Uh, this is my neighborhood. Stay out. We control the drugs and extortion in, in, this, in this particular neighborhood. And that was the, the bent on the story. So tell me how true that was. Oh, it's absolutely not true. In fact, the meeting at Twin Peaks was publicized at the Texas Confederation of Clubs and Independent Meeting, and it's a Region 1 meeting that happens in Well, Texas. you didn't read that at all, Double D. I mean, you didn't read that yeah. at all. You, you just no, read you it was two you, gangs. They, yeah, they, yeah. they got mad at each other, and they started shooting. I thought I was watching Sons of Anarchy. Even worse, I have to jump in. Even worse, they claimed that they were shooting at the police officers were the first yeah, initial reports. Well, the thing is that this stereotype and the way that the news and entertainment media works is sensationalism sells stories. Sensationalism buys airtime. One of the things that I find extremely curious is how revealing and how talkative the Waco law enforcement agencies were, uh, uh, particularly uh, the spokesperson Swanton during the first 48 to 72 hours following the Waco, right? Very, very active mischaracterizing this as a gang meeting, not acknowledging things that obviously the resources of the Waco Police Department should allow them to at least do some cursory research on the Internet to understand that this was a meeting that was publicized. None of that was done. They took the opportunity, while the national news media was focused on the incident, to spread as much sensationalized fear as they possibly could to justify what they were doing. I mean, there were, there were absurd things that happened in Waco 24 hours after this incident. They issued a warning to all motorcyclists in Waco saying, don't ride your your motorcycle on the streets of Waco because we can't tell the difference between a biker and a gang member. I mean, this was the type of hyperbole and sensationalism was used to justify what they were doing. And then, as soon as the national news media was deterred and focused elsewhere, the Waco Police Department went silent and started embracing a narrative of silence, which has now turned into the biggest issue concerning Waco is all the information they haven't released about the incident. So I think that they took the opportunity in the first 48 to 72 hours to completely sensationalize and and uh, basically fog the issue of the truth, because the truth of the matter is it was the Texas Confederation of Clubs and Independence meeting that has occurred every other month for 
nearly 15 years. In fact, I attended the meeting previous to this meeting in Waco. I very easily could have been there if I would have chose. To was it at the same uh, same venue? Uh, the meeting? No, it wasn't at the same venue. This one was in Waco, and the previous one was at a restaurant in Austin. They moved these meetings around. They moved these meetings around between the different areas. Um, um, just to make it easier for certain people to go, you know, and, and so that way every meeting is not in Austin, or every meeting is not in Wake, or every meeting is not in Houston. They generally move around. So this was uh, way, a confederation of Texas Confederation of Clubs, which is an affiliate of the National. Am I correct? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're part of, of the National uh, uh, Confederation of Clubs and um, completely integrated with the national system. In fact. One of the individuals that was arrested in Waco was one of the most preeminent political rights activists in the motorcycling community that we have, an extremely effective individual who happened to show up to the meeting to discuss a national meeting that actually Jim and I attended the previous week, over the, the weekend of May 10th, where every major motorcycle organization in the country had representatives that gathered in Denver for a national meeting between confederations of clubs. Um, a week later... Uh, uh, this event happened, and the individual that I'm talking about, uh, a friend of mine, his name is Paul Landers, and he is heavily involved in the Texas Confederation of Clubs and Independents and also the U.S. Defenders and the core program that Jim's involved in, was showing up to that meeting for the sole purpose of giving a report on this national meeting that we have. You know, I, I'm, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here, I'm going, you know, a lot of times, I, I, again, I spent 20 years as a cop, uh, there's two stories. You hear the one side, the other side, and then somewhere there's the truth. Now, um, you, you tell, and I'm going to say this with all due respect, a very believable story here that this was a, a, a meeting. But where, I mean, where do you think it came from that this was nothing more than two rival gangs that were trying to duke it out over turf? Where did that come from? Well, you, well I, I read an interesting article in the Waco Tribune just yesterday that discussed this issue about labeling organizations like these motorcycle clubs gangs. And uh, the article made an excellent argument. It says that the uh, motorcycle club community has become one of law enforcement's boogeymen. Well, one of the interesting things that the article discussed is the same agencies that label these organizations criminal gangs, for example, are the same agencies that approve concealed weapon permits for members of these organizations and have for years. And another comparison that was made is that you do not see a lot of individuals being charged with felonies from those organizations in the state of Texas. In fact, in the city of Houston, more law enforcement officers in the last year have been charged with felonies than any motorcycle club. And so in a lot of ways, I believe that it's a stereotype, and that stereotype is something that we deal with in law enforcement often. I mean, I don't think that you would have been able to find very many law enforcement officers in the state that racial profiling bills have passed that would have agreed with it because it's an indict on their practices. And sometimes it's hard to be criticized. But the simple fact of the matter is sometimes law enforcement needs to be trained on simple concepts like behavior versus action. And I believe that's the exact same issue uh, that occurred in the racial profiling debate, and it's the exact same issue that's occurring here. We're, 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 we're a complete culture that is based on expression of our associations. Motorcycle clubs are expressing their constitutional right to association through wearing motorcycle club covers. You know, and that again, that, that, that's an application can't be enough to establish criminal it, behavior. It's if it was, here's the test. It would be illegal to be a member of any of those organizations if the arguments they made were true. You know, it's, it's an interesting concept, what you say. We're going to explore. We've got a couple of minutes left, and then we're going to take a break. But, Jim, I want to bring you involved in this in this last, last discussion here. Why do you think there was just a disparity? between media reports and now what I'm hearing from Double D, and he sounds, I'm again, Double D, I haven't met you, I don't see you, you're, you're calling in, but you sound like a very extremely articulate individual that's well-versed in, in, in the subject matter here, but I'm going to throw this over to Jim. Jim, what, uh, what do you think? Well, I can only speculate. I'm in New York. Um, this was Texas. But after following every report that's been coming out, I've been following this very closely, the only thing I can think of is to get the jump on, to get the public perception behind law enforcement on what took place. Because people, they, they read um, sensational things. that gets their attention. They hear three minutes worth of something that was sensational. Now they go on and they just live their life and they don't worry about the details to follow. And I believe it was law enforcement's opportunity to get the public perception that these were bad motorcycle gang members and these were dangerous. They had the audacity mm -hmm. to have a fight in an open area, a public place where innocent people would have been hurt. They shot at police officers allegedly. So now 95 Five percent of the public is like, oh, my God, you better do something with these people. You, you better put them away. And now when facts need to come out, 
they're not coming out because it's going to change the perception that the police tried to get the public relations head start on. Double D, you want to jump in on that? I I do want to jump in on that because I think Jim's analysis is exactly right. I mean, one of the most important things, not one of the most important things, the most important thing about the Waco incident should be the due process issues and the excessive bail issues. There's a concept in this country where we do not infringe upon the civil liberties of innocent people in order to punish guilty people. In fact, there's, you know, the old Blackstone ratio saying that it would be better to allow 10 guilty people to go free than to allow one innocent person to suffer. And I now, I, I want you to just hold that thought. We're going to take a break, but I want to come back with that because I think that's a, uh, a great concept to begin with. Thank you for listening to Eye on Crime, but we're going to be back with this interesting discussion with Double D, with the Washington State Confederation of Clubs, and also Jim Baugh, not only president of Long Island Bay, but with the Coalition of Independent Riders. We're talking about the, particularly the incident in Waco, Texas, but um, we got more to talk about. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back.